Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to Victoria 3. Today we're going to be taking a look at the user interface and the user experience of the game, checking out all the buttons that should concern you that will affect your primary amount of play. This video is going to be a very long one, so I hope you're ready to sit down, grab a snack, maybe grab lunch and take a look, but also know that I will have chapters set up for this. So let's start by taking a look at your prestige, your country information, and your capacity resources. So we are going to start in the upper left with your ranking. Now, if you click on your ranking, it lists all of the countries that are currently in the game. A very simple breakdown of the country, the prestige ranking, or the ranking overall. Your country prestige is very important. Your GDP, which is your gross domestic product. Your standard of living, so you can see kind of how you compare to others. Lubeck is doing very, very well overall. And then, of course, population with the Great Qing, the Chinese Empire, having vastly, vastly more than anyone else does. That's pretty cut and dry. I don't reference this very often, but you certainly can just to kind of see how you're doing. But note that the four over here means that uh, you are rank four. And as Austria, you start as a great power. Moving on to your country information. If you click on your flag at any time, it gives you a very brief overview of your country as a whole, from your ranking, your battalions, to your GDP population, literacy. A lot of these things you can see in other areas. But one of the two most important things here is one, the government that you have and the interest groups that have are in the government at the time. You can see their influence and how much clout they have. And also your infamy. Your infamy is a level of how other countries see you in a negative light. If you expand too often or you take more than what they think you should, you'll gain infamy and people won't like you as much, may start forming wars against you. And you can, of course, hover over Kaiser Ferdinand von Hasburg to get an idea of who that your leader is as well. It's important to note that you don't play as this leader. It's not like Crusader Kings 3. You don't have a personal involvement. Rather, you're almost like an Illuminati, or you're kind of this being that hovers over the country as a whole. That's a brief overview of the information. Diplomacy is very important in that it lets you see at a glance what people think of you in terms of their attitude and their relations towards you. Now, those are two separate things, although they do typically go hand in hand. An attitude is, for example, Russia would consider us a desirable ally, but relations-wise, we're just cordial. That can seem a bit confusing, but there certainly is a difference between attitude and relations. Next down, we see wars, diplomatic plays. A diplomatic play includes things like pushing for an objective, like say I want to try and get Saxony. If I start a diplomatic play to want to conquer them, that will show up. But then, of course, it does other things that you might be involved in as your interest in a region determines your ability to affect diplomatic plays. And then last, this gives an overview of your diplomatic status. Rivalries, custom unions, puppets, uh, trade agreements, alliances overall, uh, even uh, dominions, things of that nature. There's a lot of things that you can briefly see what you are about and your diplomatic relations across the globe. And then last but not least in the country information tab is your modifiers. I don't look at this a whole lot However, it does contain a lot of useful information if you're wanting to decipher some things. Uh, for instance, like cotton plantations have a, have a throughput or an efficiency increase because you have the cotton gin. We can go down and see that the Austrian aristocracy, the landowners, have 70% political strength, and that's because of the laws of monarchy, hereditary bureaucrats, and a local police force. So that's, those are affected by laws. So that means, by default, you could remove that political strength if you were to change those laws. We'll address that in a different video, but just know that is one thing that you can do. And then this just gives you everything. I mean, every every possible modifier across uh, your country as a whole will allow you to be seen here just so you can get an idea. So for instance, we have high mortality or at least a mortality rate because we allow children to have uh, jobs in those interests. So. Uh, just to something to think about if you wanted to kind of get an overview of your country before you're wanting to start anything. Now, though, we are going to move on to capacities. There are four sets of capacities. Ah, I don't know what you consider money a capacity. 
Not necessarily. But anyways, we're going to start with bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is your ability of your government to run your country. Uh, it is not a stockpiled resource. None of these three are stockpiled resources. That means I'm not getting 168 weekly. I just have a positive balance overall. Now, your bureaucracy is generated solely from government administration and a few techs. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're running low on bureaucracy, you need to simply develop more government administrations and or develop production methods for those administration buildings. Now, bureaucracy is used up in a variety of ways. It's in your incorporated states, suck up a lot of it. You do have pops that do as well. So as your pops increase, your bureaucracy will naturally decrease. You have different laws that may, uh, institutions rather, which we'll go into in the laws section. But note that you can increase the effectiveness of an institution at the cost of bureaucracy. And also trade routes will have a large effect. You cannot import or export without using up bureaucracy unless you're in a trade agreement. So that's a pretty good incentive. If you find that you have a lot of trade import export routes with a certain country, it might be worth a little bit of diplomacy to enact a trade agreement and get all of those back. And then of course your military takes up bureaucracy as well. So all those things to consider, a positive balance in bureaucracy will give you a state construction efficiency. So you'll construct things much more efficient uh, with, uh, I do believe a little bit faster is actually the technical term. The issue of negative bureaucracy is that you will actually have tax waste. You will literally be losing money if you have a negative bureaucracy and that's not a good thing to have. So keep those in mind with bureaucracy. Next up is authority. Now, authority is interesting in that it is the grip that you have on your country to affect it as the person running your country. It is solely generated from laws uh, and text, just like bureaucracy is. But we can see here that we currently have a lot of authority because we have some rather restrictive laws. And that's one thing you're going to need to consider that as your country progresses, you are going to enable laws that are more progressive. Those will naturally come with less authority. So you can try and keep a hold of your nation, keep them in the old way of things, as, as you can imagine, but that will cost you in potential radicals or uh, countries not seeing you in a good light. But having authority uh, is essentially really, really good for two main things. The first one is consumption taxes. You can literally tax the people for consuming a certain good. So we can see here that even though I have a positive balance, if that were to be negative for some reason, for 500 authority, I could I could have a, a $26,000 tax on grain. Now, mind you, you are taxing people for food that they need or any of these things are things that they need. So as a result, their standard of living will go down and it will generate radicals. So I only use consumption taxes whenever I have the need to kind of boost my economy temporarily. I would not rely on consumption taxes, no matter how profitable it might be, because it does decrease a standard of living. And like I said, increases the radicals. The other benefit of authority is decrees. And we're gonna go over this in a little bit, but just as a thing real quick, we can see different things, uh, decrees that we have. For instance, if I had a large agricultural presence in Transdanubia, I could encourage agricultural industries, which would increase agriculture, ranchers, and plantations efficiency by 20% at the cost of 100 authority. You can do several good things with decrees, and we're not going to go into it right now. We will address them in a little bit, but know that that's what authority is used for. We have an excess of authority right now, which means that we have a reduction in enactment time. And that simply means that a law does take time to go through the process of being enacted. A positive authority balance will give you a reduction in that time, allowing you to pass laws quicker, assuming that you have the support. One last area that authority affects, I forgot to mention this, and that's pretty daggum important, so I'm glad I didn't forget, was that you have the capability of suppressing or bolstering a interest group or an interest group. Uh, bolstering makes them ha have a 
very positive increase in attraction at the cost of 200 authority. Now suppressing is the opposite. There is a minus 40%. This is important if you have a, an interest group that's getting a little too powerful or you're wanting to increase the power of another interest group to try and get them into the government and allow them to affect different laws. Next up is influence, and that is your ability to affect other countries around the world and how they look at you. Now, this is more than just that, of course, but influence is primarily generated by your rank. You can see there, because we are a great power, we actually get a lot of influence. Rivalry with Prussia gains us a lot as well, and family ties to the Austrian aristocracy, a range of things. But regardless, influence is used for several, several things. And we can see some diplomatic actions like improving relations or setting up alliances, even getting in some custom union. And we can see right there that we do have three people already in a customs union that is kind of sucking up a little bit. But it is never a bad idea to use up your influence as, as much as is effective in order to shape the world around you. For instance, we have Russia and we have France are going to be our two biggest squeezes. We don't want to go with Prussia because we have a rivalry against them. But I have so much. Heck, I could even influence the Ottoman Empire, which isn't going to have, uh, which doesn't really look like they like me a lot. But regardless, your influence can be used in a wide area of uh, things to do. And it is important that you use that as much as you can to influence the world around you, because especially as a smaller country, you're going to want to build up some snuggly cuddlies with some of the bigger nations. And I think influence will be the absolute key to ensuring that. And then last of your, I won't even call this capacity. Your last resource is money. And this is accumulative, positively or negatively. So we can see right here a very quick breakdown in your money tab. This gives us our balance. We are currently making 15 and a half thousand gold, whatever you want to call it, a week. We have a gold reserve limit. Currently, we have 2.73 million in gold reserves. That's basically we have money in the bank and we do have a limit of 5.46. So that means we have a lot of wiggle room before we even start to get into debt. And we'll look at the debt ceiling here in just a little bit, whenever we get over to the left panels. But know that there are benefits to kind of living in debt, assuming that you don't have a major crisis on your hands. Your investment pool is your upper strata people's ability to invest in the businesses that they own. All of your buildings, unless they are government run, are going to be in the public sector. And that means that the public, if they have extra cash, they can invest in that opportunity. This is very important because depending on your laws, you will be able to utilize that investment pool for certain buildings. For instance, I played a United States run in which I enabled the laws of the investment pool to affect agriculture and infrastructure, and there were a ton of investors investing in that pool. I had several million in gold or in investment pool money, and therefore I was able to build several agricultural buildings and build up a bunch of railways that I actually did not pay for myself that came out of that investment pool. Figuring out how to get your pops to invest is the best way to save money and the best way to figure out the infrastructure of your country and how it progresses forward. Below that, we see your national revenue and your expenses. This is a list of different revenue and expenses. You'll notice here that income tax is going to be one of the bigger ones as well as poll taxes. These will change based on your laws and based on your budgeting. We'll go over that in just a little bit with its own tutorial. But you can also see that your goods and your wages for your government and your military are your largest expenses. The best way that you can reduce that is to reduce the cost of those resources. Something we'll get to later on or hopefully you can figure out on your own. And then, of course, you see your balancing gold reserves. If, if we had continued on, you would see the progression. Doesn't really matter right now, but know that this is your money tab. Those are your top line resources. And below here is a toggable set of resources as well. I leave it locked on simply because it allows me to have a quick reference guide. We're going to go over it very, very briefly. For one, you have your gross domestic product, your GDP. We can see we are currently number seven worldwide. Your literacy rate. This is important to me because it allows you to kind of see your country progressing towards a literate rate. Literacy is very important. It helps your technology spread. It actually politically activates your population. So the more literate they are, 
the more they are going to be invested into the political system. And so it just gives you a good idea. If you're kind of seeing over time that this is progressing forwards, then you're probably in a good spot unless you're playing a, a weird run. Your standard of living is important. It is very important. It, it basically lets you know how well your pups are living. Right now, 11.3 on average across all of your population is not good. It is impoverished. Now, there are ways we can increase this. I'm not going over that right at this moment, but know that this is a good thing to keep locked up there so you can see how it is being affected by changes within your country, changes within the market, changes within your pops. Because as you gain that, you're going to have a better standard of living. You're going to have more money. You're going to have a better overall quality of life for your country, not just for the pops living in it. This, of course, is population. We can have a 0.13 pop growth across the board, which is netting us 47,500 pops every year. It's not fantastic, but it's not terrible either. And then lastly, your radicals and your loyalists. This is important to me because if you see a very sudden jump in your radicals, there's no other quick and easy reference way to see that number than by hovering over the radicals guide. And that will basically give you an idea. Okay, I am passing a law. Oh wow, there's a, suddenly I have 100% more radicals than I did before. May not be the best time to enact that law. Loyalists, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the tooltip says that they're pleased with their country and willing to defend it. The approval of interest groups supported by loyalist pops has improved. I haven't seen the direct effects of this per se. And only in two of my runs have I seen my loyalists outnumber my radicals, despite it seeming like that's the way the country wants to go. But still, it goes side and side. You can't toggle each of these individuals off. So that's not something that you really have to worry about. One thing to mention uh, that I just saw over here is that by hovering over your GDP, I didn't see this before, but you are able to see your infrastructure levels as well as unemployed pops and the different level of apparently only peasants uh, available to you. So Peasants, for instance, only work on subsistence farms. It's a little sidetracking here. So to get them out and into the workforce, you'll have to develop your agriculture or find ways to get rid of arable land. So this is a good idea. I can reference my GDP right here and be like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, my Trans Danubia, yeah, I actually said that right, has a lot of infrastructure available to it. I should use that when I go to build things. So just keep that in mind across those bars. The last two things we're going to briefly look at is your current situation and then other notifications, as I call them. Your current situation allows you to see several things in your empire that you may want to address. For me, I don't, I don't need to know this and I don't need to know unused construction capacity. I can see that over there and we'll look at it in a minute. These are important things to note. And this is kind of the deal with the current situation. It'll say, hey, you need to tax your people more efficiently. Or, hey, government goods are expensive. Or, hey, you know, oh, I don't know, you're about to have a revolution. Things of that nature really show some unproductive trade routes is another one. Just gives you little tidbits of information that you may want to address. It's not stuff that you're constantly pestered about, but just know that it's going to be there. And then the last part of this section is going to be your other notifications. This will include things like no active research, uh, if you have armies that don't have a front assigned to them, uh, if your armies are taking heavy attrition, if you're about to have a revolution, things of that nature, it's just kind of important, oh crap, you should address this. I will say that there will be things, events that occur on the right side of the screen that I wish would pop up here because I don't tend to see this right side. That's a little user interface, user experience uh, feedback that I would give. But regardless, this is going to give you a good idea of things that you need to immediately attend to. And that will wrap up this section of the top user interface, your capacities, your country, modifiers, uh, and then, of course, your situational kind of awareness. This is a really good overview of your empire as a whole. And so it's essential that you figure it out and you learn it and you figure out how to use it correctly. All right, so we are going to start with your time and your clock. This is obviously the date. This is the day of the week, which is pretty important. And the faster that you go, the faster that week will go through pretty standard for all paradox games but what you're going to see here is your time if we were to hit pause or play we have a really really cool animation i just wanted to point that out and then of course you have five different speeds now 
Speed 5 is pretty much unlocked, as it were. It will get a little cumbersome in the mid to late game where you may eventually want to do Speed 4, but do know that the number pad plus or minus will influence the speed. The shortcuts 1 through 5, which is going to be on your top of your keyboard, will also affect said speed, and space simply pauses and unpauses. For me, I always use my number pad. If you don't have one, it's understandable. There are ways to influence that outside of it. We have your menu here. I'm not going to click on it because it's the menu. But what's really good here is the Wikipedia. Now, the Wikipedia has a lot of things. They have different game concepts. Essentially, every tooltip that is in Victoria 3 is in the Wikipedia. But on top of that, if you skip the tutorial series or if you just want to try and figure out things on your own, there are a couple of tutorial lessons that are built into the Wikipedia including how to fix a capacity deficit. Those, remember, is any of these three figures over here. Next is your budget, how to balance your budget, which is something that we looked at. And then last is why you want to balance your budget. Now, uh, those are pretty essential. I actually recommend doing the tutorial because I think it would be incredibly helpful for you. Uh, but regardless, the, uh, the Wikipedia is right there at your disposal. It may be incomplete, just as a forewarning, but of course they try to work on it as much as they can to really make it as complete as possible. Next up, we have construction, and construction is a resource that is not stockpiled and that is not used until you are building a building. Construction is literally just a resource. That it's called construction, and it is determined by various things. You have a base value of five, but the more construction sectors that you have, the higher that goes up. And then on top of that, your production method will also determine how much construction is being used. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat. Every building has a construction amount. Typically for things like farms, that's 150. Your industrial buildings might be three to four, even 500 construction. It just depends. And you would be able to see that by hovering over a new building right here. Your government administration takes 300 construction. So that means if this was the only building that we built, it would take, what, 15 weeks? Something along those lines to develop that one singular building. Now, there is a, something that needs to be mentioned in that regardless, now there are some factors that are a bit unknown, but pretty much as a standard, your construction can only pump 19.8 construction per week into a single building. Now that means that at 21 construction, I could have two buildings going. One would be going all the way 19.8 every week. The other one would do that, what, 1.2 every week? So if I had 60 construction, in theory, I would have three buildings plus a little bit of one. So I want to make it clear that if I had 60 construction and my government administration takes 300, I cannot pump 60 construction into it and get it done in five weeks. That's not how the game operates. As a friend told me just today, actually, before I started recording this, have you ever heard of throwing more people at a job and it getting done faster? He makes a very good point. And being in the construction industry for my real job, I can tell you that certainly does not end well. Touche. Touche. So anyways, uh, good caveats for those to just keep in mind for construction. Next, you'll have your active journal entries. Your journal is over here, and at any point in your journal entries that are active, you can pin them to your outline. Now that goes the same for various things like your market, for instance, uh, or as we see here, your commanders, things of that nature. This allows you to, over here, just have a set list of things you can reference at any time. Your active journals will be there. I actually thought the markets in a previous patch were right underneath it. Maybe they weren't. But this gives you kind of a brief overview of the things that are currently going on in your country. This includes diplomacy. In the last video, I showed you a little bit of the diplomatic plays that we can do. And so right now you see an active list of the countries that I am improving diplomatic relations with, along with a timer bar of how long it will take to influence those. These list your commanders and of course your different markets. This allows you to pin certain things that are very important to things to consider overall. And then down below at the very bottom is a journal entry system. This will 
it's a little bit spammy at the moment, I'm not gonna lie. So if you see that and you're wondering if it's a bug, I don't know if it's a bug. I think they just haven't figured out how to handle it correctly. There's so much that goes on in this world that you as a country can see. And so having that pop in all the time, constantly, I've kind of numbed my mind to it. But it's important to know that that's where your journal entries will be or your other just everything will be. Um, so that way you can reference it and you can, of course, hide them. Now, I know that scene pretty fast, but honestly, it's pretty straightforward on what your right side of your user interface does. You have your time, so you can keep track of time. You have your construction, journal entries, diplomatic plays. That's this entire section, I didn't clarify, is diplomatic plays. So if someone, you are wanting to do a war or something is going down in the region that you have an interest in, it will show up there. Your wars will show up there. And then, of course, this gives you just a really good breakdown of your different generals and their uh, their troops along with your admirals. So overall, this is a really good referencing system. And I honestly don't have an issue with putting eight, nine different active journal entries because I can hover over them and see exactly what I'm trying to go for. It gives me a little bit of direction for all for my country. And honestly, as you can see here, there's so much space that this doesn't ever really get cluttered. And I think that's a pretty important thing to say. So that will wrap up this right section of the user interface. Your lenses give you the capacity to see certain things throughout your empire and honestly throughout the world. But first, before we get into that, a quick thing, a location finder. This is very crucial. So if you said, oh, I saw a thing that said something about Senegal. Oh, hey, look, there is a French state called Senegal and it allows me to go there. Um, what, man, I saw something like the U.S. is doing something with Oregon. Oh, hey, look at that. Oregon is not only a state, but it is a state region, right? So the location finder is very, very crucial. And I think it's a fantastic thing that has helped me many, many a time. And then on the other side, very quickly, you have your map. Now, if you hold tab, as it says, it will zoom out. That's a little bit unnecessary. I don't really like it, but this does allow you to see various things and this is your map filter national gdp we can see where our national gdp is uh basically coming from most of our gdp uh, is coming from bohemia you can see there it's 14 percent, so that's pretty pretty hefty we could go in and we could see our military if we wanted to see where our hqs are things of that nature just really really solid things to look at and a lot of these contain worldwide stuff. So we can see here that uh, Bessa Arabia doesn't have great quality of living and I would hate to be li living in some of these places where they are starving, but I would really love to be living in places like the Midlands. Well, probably not actually enjoy living there, but you know what I mean in the game anyways, because the standard of living is high. And then of course you can click that again to go back to your default map mode. Now for the political lenses, we're going to walk through each of these very quickly. Your production lens is exactly that. It's showing the production buildings of your country, and they are broken up into agriculture, the different types of farms that you can currently have based on the lands that you own, resources, so the, again, the resources based on the various states that we are in control of, and of course, your industry. Now, I will say this, industry is something that you can build. This doesn't mean that I can only have an arms industry in Transdanubia or whatever, or shipyards obviously need a coast. But this basically just says, hey, you have the capability of building these buildings in any of your states. Now, that isn't always the case. You can see right here, shipyards can only be built in four locations. It's the same for all of these. Typically, with resources, you're a little bit limited. Pretty much logging camps can be built everywhere, but that's not always the case. But just know this is a fantastic way if like, oh man, I need wheat farms because my people need grain. Well, where can I build that? Okay, cool. Well, grain will also give me wine, so that's cool. And I can build in 23 different states. Rye farms, however, which give you liquor, can only be built in Bohemia and West Galicia. So you have to consider that. You just, you have to because... There's places that you can't build. The same goes for your resources. We don't have any gold mines, at least uh, not yet, right? It's resource quantity. So that's a really good way to get an overview of the things inside of your country. 
going on to political lenses, it's the same ordeal. You can build your, uh, your politically minded things like your construction sectors, your government administration. All of these can be built anywhere. You just have to have other considerations. Decrees is where it gets really fun. This is limited, of course, to your country, as is all things for the political realm. But your decrees are very, very powerful tools. If you'll remember, if you watched the first uh, the uh, capacities tutorial, I mentioned that you have authority, especially a lot of it in the early game. Decrees allow you to sway your states with certain benefits. For instance, if I had a place, let's say West Slovakia. Oh no, let's go to a place that doesn't have a lot of capacity left. Bohemia is a good one. We don't have a lot of infrastructure left. This is essentially room for eight agricultural buildings or four industrial buildings. So Bohemia has, uh, let's say, what do they have that we might want? Okay, we really need a lot more iron, but I can only build four of them. I need to boost that up. The issue roads maintenance increases infrastructure by 25% and gives you a state construction efficiency of 10%. We do that, and now we take a look at Bohemia. They had 68, now they have 85, and that is due to the 25% increase from road maintenance. If you have a country or if you have an area that produces a lot of, uh, a, lot of a certain resource, say it was agriculturally minded, Styria, for instance, doesn't have a lot, but say we wanted to make it so. I could go down to my decrees, I could hit encourage agricultural industry and I'm good there. Or if I have a resource heavy region, promoting stability or social mobility is good because it gives you qualifications for your pops to move up and down the system to fill certain jobs. So if for instance, say I had an industrial place or if I had a place that had a lot of buildings that they weren't being filled because there wasn't a lot of qualifications. You could slap down promote social mobility and that would allow a flexibility in your promotions and your education access. Do not forget about decrees, especially in the early game. And especially if you are a smaller country as Belgium, for instance, you only have two states, which means you have the capabilities of pumping several decrees into those two states to really boost things up a lot. Now, an important thing also with the political lens is that you get to see your interest groups and their influences throughout each individual state, right? So here we can see that the Austrian aristocracy has the highest political strength. Uh, we can see here, it's the aristocracy, it's the aristocracy. Hey, guess what? It's the aristocracy. This just gives you a good idea on what you want to focus on. You could boost the aristocracy or you could see if you enacted a law that removed their political strength, you would see who would pop up next in line, which would be the armed forces, which means they would get more political influence, which you could utilize for your government. I did forget to mention that production lens, if you zoom in close enough, does give you your uh, infrastructure abilities. But remember from the first tutorial that you could also just simply hover over your GDP to find that out as well. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. Next up is your diplomatic lens. You got to remember political lens is within your own country. A diplomatic lens affects everything outside of it. We start with three sections, regional actions, diplomatic plays, and diplomatic actions. You can declare interests. Now, I honestly don't know what determines the amount of interest that you can have. I'm not well versed in that yet, but you can see we have a maximum of six and we've used six. We are interested in Iberia, Occitania, Rhine, North Germany, Dnieper. I'm sure I'm, I ruined that. And Anatolia. What does that mean? A declared interest means that you are interested in this political region or this diplomatic region. And that means anything that goes on in these six regions, we can have an influence on. So for instance, if Prussia decides to go after Saxony, I will get what's called a diplomatic play pop up on the right hand side. And essentially that means, okay, I have a, an invested interest in this. And because of that, I can influence it. I could side with Saxony. I could declare neutrality. I could do all sorts of things. But that's essentially what your declared interest does. Now, if you have colonial affairs institution and an interest in a region, 
you can definitely start colonies. Now, we're going to do this just for kicks. I'm going to declare not an interest there, and we could do an interest in, well, let's see. We'll declare an interest in Congo. Now, it does take a, a minute for this to enact. We're not going to go through all of that because I don't want anything else popping up. But now that I have a declared interest, I would be able to establish a colony once I got the Colonial Affairs Institute built. But outside of that, because I've declared an interest in that region, anything that goes on here, if Portugal decides to go after Kasanji, I could say, hey, I'm going to support these guys, or heck, I'll even support Portugal. Declaring interest is a very powerful tool and it'll allow you to do a lot of flexible things. Your diplomatic plays work just like your other operations did. This gives you a range of diplomatic things that you can do and the number of tar valid targets. I could annex Krak Krakow if I wanted to. I could ban slavery in the Ottoman Empire if I win that war. These are diplomatic plays and the exact things that will pop up over here. Conquering the state of Cilicia will start a diplomatic play, there we go, with the uh, with Prussia. Now, I probably, uh, I might be able to win this if I play my cards right, but that's what will pop up over here. This is a diplomatic play. And so again, once you have a diplomatic play, you can't do anything else for diplomatic plays. That's important to note. I can't say I'm going to try and invade three places at once. It just doesn't work. Now, I could back down, not just yet, but uh, regardless, that's what's going to happen. And we can see who has invested an interest in this. Right now, it's only Great Britain and Russia. Now, more countries might come in, sure, but right now, that's all that's going to happen. Next up are diplomatic actions. And this is different outside of diplomatic plays, although you can see the same system of having valid targets is there. This is the diplomatic plays or diplomatic actions where I can do not plays but interact with the nations around me. I can improve relations, I can expel diplomats, which is not good. Uh, I can invite people to a customs union, whether they'll come in or not is uh, different. But this gives me a range of actions. And honestly, it's those actions that will determine a lot of the times how diplomatic plays play, how diplomatic plays play out. If I'm really buddy-buddy with Russia, and I'm really buddy-buddy with France and Great Britain, and I go after Prussia, the likelihood that Russia will join on Prussia's side might not happen, simply because, well, he doesn't want or they don't want to risk uh, damaging the relations with me, I'm stronger than Austria, than Prussia, etc., etc. There's lots of diplomatic plays or actions that go on here, but do know that all of them, if I remember correctly, will influence how much influence you have left. So keep that in mind. Moving on to the military lens. It's the same system, guys. You're starting to see a repeat of how useful the lens is, but also how usable it is. Here, I can build barracks in 25 states. I can build naval bases in four states. My army, I can activate conscription centers, which I would probably want to do in order to get going with war. Uh, against Prussia very quickly. This basically just gives you a list. I can select the states themselves or I can filter and just click here to enact them. Goodness gracious. And then of course I can recruit more generals. We have, you see, one general in each of the, uh, the, the HQs, but we could hire more if we needed to. It's just a quick and easy toggle button to get there. And then of course your navy, recruit admirals. Very cut and dry. Your trade lens is very, very cool. Because not only can you build construction centers and ports, you could move your market capital. I don't know that I've ever done this, nor will I ever do it. I don't know the benefits of it. This is pretty cool in that it gives you a toggle way to start some import and export trade routes. Obviously, we can only, um, <coughs> excuse me, we can only import things that are available. So right now, things like airplanes, automobiles, ironclads aren't available to us. But all of the resources, this is what everyone else can and is producing that we could import into our country. And of course, the valid targets. Now, what's really nice about this is that it allows you to see how many convoys you have available. Every import trade route uses up convoys. So that's important to remember. If we clicked on ammunition, we would then be able to see the options available to us and if they're going to be profitable. 
I don't recommend doing an unprofitable trade route. It just doesn't make sense. It's not going to affect things so drastically that I think it'd be worth losing money on. But at the same time, if you're paying an exorbitant amount, let's find, I don't know, I think coal was a good one. If you're paying a stupidly high amount, uh, then it's going to be beneficial regardless. I guess here it would be a good instance. If we were to go into the Danish market, the impact on the cost of clippers in our market would drop by nine pounds. That's a decent amount. It's not fantastic, but it's not terrible. Um, you know, so just keep in mind that you can totally do that here. You can also enact any trade routes from the market tab. But the same goes for exports. Obviously, we cannot export anything we don't produce ourselves. But by holding or by clicking on any of the resources, we are immediately sent to uh, the screen here, which will allow you that stuff. An important thing to remember is that I honestly would not export basic goods, no matter how enticing it might be, because you'll see here, if we export lead to the French market, our lead price within our own market goes up drastically. So that means if I were to export fish, uh, that doesn't go up that much. I do wish I had better examples here. But we can see here that uh, exporting meat, which is a basic good uh, needed by our population, would go up by two pounds. That's not a lot, but you get my idea. If we were to export something that would drastically increase, this goes up by almost four pounds in our market. It hits your pops, which decreases your standard of living. Just something to keep in mind of. Uh, but yeah, you can do a whole lot of things here. And... You can just do a whole lot of things with all of these lenses. So I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind how you can utilize the lenses across the board to really help figure things out for your nation. It's a very important tool, and I'm really glad that uh, Victoria 3 has it in here, and I hope that it helps you out significantly. So with the focus on these minor buttons, these uh, you will certainly reference them from time to time. Uh, we will see just how much. Uh, I don't use these near as much as I use the big buttons, which I'm going to say is why they're in the smaller button. But first, we're going to start at the bottom and go to the top. The map list gives you the exact same uh, map list that the prestige ranking does. And in fact, when you click on that, you see that that lights up. Very cool. Now, so pretty cut and dry. This You've seen this before. This lists country, GDP, standard of living, all sorts of things. So uh, very important things to consider. If you want to know where your country is at. Also, the outliner. The outliner is very, very cool. And honestly, I think this almost should be a bigger button simply because it gives you a very good overview of your country from a different standpoint than what we looked at in this flag. So you can see here your interest groups and their political clout. This is important to see so you can get a really easy idea on what you need to do. Not only that, but regarding your interest groups, it shows whether uh, what different uh, attributes that they have enabled. We can see right now we get 20% influence since this interest group is powerful and since they're at least happy. Uh, if we were to get to loyal, we would get 20% aristocrat investment pool contribution. So you can get a very brief view on all of the different things and what it would take to do that. Of course, this is minus five. This is at plus five. That's a plus 10. Just to keep that in mind. Now you can also, this is another set of things that we can pin to the side here. So at any given time, I could simply have a list of what my interest groups are doing at this current state. Now, one of the cool things also is that it gives you your marginalized groups, but what I'm gonna be completely honest with you guys. I have never used my commander's trait. And in fact, I always, I always keep it minimized. So the fact that I can indeed remove these is great although it doesn't remove them at all. Oh, because I have that. There we go. So I think that's awesome. I do wish you could pin more markets than just the Austrians or your native countries. And maybe that's a bit of feedback I'll give. Uh, but then, of course, it gives your states, all the states and their, I assume their population. Yes. And by clicking, by the way, I didn't mention this, but by clicking any of these, you immediately go back to or you go to its corresponding uh, more detailed list, I should say. So we can go here, we can see everything about this specific general. Franz von Benjera. And then, of course, if we go to our states, it brings us to uh, overview your building's population and stuff. We'll, we'll see that in just a minute. 
But overall, this is a really good thing to have. And indeed, you could have your states up there. I don't really know why you would, unless you just really, really want to make sure you're checking out one of those states. I would highly recommend doing this interest group because I think it's pretty important uh, to have all of that available to you. Now, next up is your journal. It gives you a list of potential journal entries to complete. Now, you don't get to see the effects of what this triggers, but you can see uh, basically you have a whole lot of things that you can do, which will each have their own trigger. And when you complete them, you'll get an event that pops up at the bottom that gives you a range of uh, different choices to affect your country. It's pretty cool. It's not required. And some of these journals may have time limiters on them. But regardless, I think it's a pretty cool thing overall to have to, to, uh, to see and to interact with because it does progress your country in some great ways. And then you have your decisions. I will say that what's interesting about this is that there are only a few varieties that make them unique. At the moment, these are all pretty much standard that every country, for the most part, could go after. Now, the map the Western American frontier is really interesting. I don't know why you would do that. You would have to own, yeah, an inter yeah it's, it's a really weird thing for Austria to want to map the American Western frontier, but you could still do it. I'm not gonna judge you if you do. But these are not things that you can uh, star to your outliner to get enacted. You kind of just have to remember or think about what it takes to get these enacted in order to do so. Your journals are very good. I like the journal system a lot. I can't wait for them to expand the journal system and the decision system. But right now, this is basically all that it is. Not in a negative light, simply all that there is. As we move along your population tab, this gives you a breakdown of all of your pops in your country. Now, I will say I honestly hate this system. And the only reason why I hate this breakdown is that I can't see a list of other things. You can see here that yes, the top three are going to be South German, Hungarian, and Northern Italian, but you can see all of the different guys and I don't have a way from this screen to click on those. I don't enjoy this system. It's a great overview, but I do wish I could interact with it more. But what you can do over here, you can see your total population, those that are politically involved and their limits, those are politically inactive in their limits, as well as your total overall standard of living. Now, what's better, what's cool about that is that you can then see a range of what your standard of living is for all of your other pops. And if I go to, if I uh, do the action, the middle mouse action, and I go over and hover over this, I see exactly what on average the middle strata needs to increase their standard of living or at least what they're paying currently to do all of that. So we can see here that the lower strata on average is paying four and a half percent higher than the base price. And that's coming from their top three consumptions of grain, liquor, and clothes. So if you wanted to increase on average the standard of living for the lower strata, you are going to need to find a way to reduce the price of grain, reduce the price of liquor, and reduce the price of clothes because those are their top three purchases. Once you are able to accomplish that, you'll see their standard of living go up and you'll see a lot of happiness come along with it. Now, what's really, really cool is that you can totally see all of these other people and what they consume. It's gonna be different, but you have your detailed list. Now, this is a little bit overwhelming. And if you looked at my first steps video, I go over this quite a bit, but your population is broken up into different uh, professions, right? You have all of your professions, but within those professions, you have a range of cultures, religions, where they live and the work, work that they have. Each variance of this is going to be represented in the detailed list. And that is very, very overwhelming. I honestly don't even know what to do with all this information, but it is there. We're still on laborers look, or peasants. There are so many different varieties and they're all represented, which is great, but this gives you a brief breakdown. And then you can hover over here and see, for instance, that the peasants overall have a political strength of 6.91 million. Now, if I were to go to the academics or the capitalists, you can see that they are drastically less in population, but have a lot more clout than uh, other people do. So it's important to really look at this. Here we go. 623,000 and 10.8 million compared to 25 
6.3 million and 6.91 million. So this just gives you a good idea of your total population and your detailed list. You could look at this at any point and see that the clerks specifically have a standard of living that is struggling and you can totally hover over that and see what they're paying for, et cetera, et cetera. Next up, we're gonna look at cultures. Your cultures are very interesting in that it gives you a breakdown of your primary cultures based and what affects that based on your citizenship law. And then also what your state religion is, which is also affected by the church and state laws. This is important because it breaks down the cultures, whether or not they are uh, discriminated against. We can see that there are a lot. The religions that they follow, the turmoil, if there were turmoil at the beginning of the game, their political strength. This is important because uh, if you are a discriminated culture, you're going to have a lot a harder time with your political strength, but then also your population. This is a pretty good overview of the cultures. And if you, for instance, saw that, I don't know, the uh, Slovene culture was having a lot of turmoil, you could see where those guys are typically going to be at. And you could figure out, okay, well, I can enact certain things to help them overall. What's also really interesting about your cultures tab is your ability to form nations. We can see here that as Austria, we have the capability of forming Germany as an empire. Now, when we click on this, we can definitely see what it takes to do so. We need, uh, we need 19 of all of these regions to be under our control in one form or another to form Germany. Now, whether that's easy or not, I can't tell you because I honestly haven't played as Germany. And note that not all countries will have this. So it will pretty be uh, pretty much be unique to certain countries alone, but it will be available to them and you can quickly see that as an overview. As we dive into tech, this is pretty cut and dry. I also went over this with the first steps, but your technology is broken up into three different branches, production, military, and society. Each country for, I wanna say 99% of the time, will have the exact same technology tree. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, and I hope that some flavor gets added for that in the future. But regardless, at the beginning of the game, that's how it is. Now, what's different is the progression of said technology trees. Belgium is very far ahead. The United States and Britain have so much technology already researched. You can see here across the board, we have a decent bit of tech overall. And the kicker here is that, well, you can only purposefully research one tech at a time. And that's not one tech per category, that's one tech overall. So this is where you need to understand your country and where you want to go with it. If you have a bunch of food industries, go for canneries because that's a good production method. If you have a lot of farms, intensive agriculture will be fantastic for you. If you're planning on expanding your military early, go after some of these things that will affect how efficient your military is. Or if you're going to kind of play a little bit taller, I highly recommend investing in banking or modern sewage to increase your infrastructure or even realism to bring in some prestige that might level you up in your rankings overall. One thing that I will say about technology, technology has spread. And this means that the more countries that know a technology that you don't, the faster it spreads to yours. Now that's important because you will have a technology in each category that will naturally be spread to you. Now you can take advantage of that in two ways. You could one, have four techs by picking your own technology that isn't one of them that's getting spread. So you could have up to four techs being researched at once or if you see a technology is being spread that you would like to get quicker, you can also invest in that technology, which will allow you to enable it quicker. Pretty cool thing that I really enjoy overall about technology. Last but certainly not least for this video is your diplomacy tab. The diplomacy screen is fantastic because it allows you an overview of all the diplomatic things that you have, right? So we see here, for instance, we have an overview of all of our interests. We have everything here. And what's cool over here is that when you declare interest, there is a 30 day breakdown in which it takes to kind of declare your interest. And it's, so right now it's inactive. We can't do anything from a diplomatic play perspective in Anatolia or in the Congo simply because, uh, well, one, we actually disabled this. So Anatolia 
would actually become an inactive interest and we would lose it. The Congo would then take 30 days to become an active interest. So it just allows you to do those sort of things uh, from that perspective. We don't have any wars yet, but we do have an active, an active diplomatic play. Your active diplomatic plays could be, again, things that you are initiating. In this case, we initiated conquering a state in Prussia, which activated that. But again, in all of your interests, excuse me, I zoomed in. If anyone declares a diplomatic play in any of these regions, it pops up for us to interact with. Now, whether you want to or not, I don't know. You could support a nation that's smaller that you know could win, or you could simply declare neutrality and not do anything. You could also ask for favors saying, hey, I'll come in and help you out if you give me something. And then lastly, down your diplomatic status. This gives you all the things that you are doing actively politically, including improving relations, rivalries, customs unions, puppets, uh, that would include dominions, trade agreements, things of that nature. Anything that has a diplomatic status tied to it will be there. But then you can open your country browser. And this is a great reference to see who you are in good with, who you're not in good with, and the infamy tied to different nations. We have 35 infamy from our diplomatic play just initiating it. So that's something you'll need to consider. If you get too high of infamy, nations will start to not like you. They may declare diplomatic plays on yourself and you may not get support from the bigger nations because, well, you're being just a little too infamous. If we go back, we do have the capabilities of releasing subjects. Now, uh, why you would do this, I really don't know, unless you wanted to release the subject of Transylvania and then switch the country and play as Transylvania. That's probably the only reason I could really think of that would be worthwhile. But regardless, you do have the capabilities of releasing these nations and you can release them as completely independent as a subject country or you can again play as Venice which I think is a cool thing to do and it certainly would be an interesting way to do a little bit of a role play let's play series as a youtuber or a streamer or simply for your own role play fun and so we are now down to things like your military your market buildings budget and your politics as mentioned we are going to briefly go over these. I will dedicate a separate user interface section to each one of these, regardless of how long it takes me. Some may be short, some may be long, but we're going to take a look at these. And these are some of your biggest areas of interaction. This is your military, which is broken up into your army, your garrisons, and your Navy. You have the capabilities of mobilizing all of them, activating your conscripts, Regulars, I will say, are dedicated military conscripts, are your service people, your regular population. Don't recommend using them unless you have no other choice. Your garrisons are your defense, essentially. If someone were to invade the area, these guys could rise up and come to your defense, which is pretty cool. And then last but not least, your navy. Austria may not have an entirely huge navy, but it is one that they could use, and we can go over those again in its own little dedicated section. But yeah, military gives you an overview of your military and your ways to affect it. Your market is going to be one of the most intense pieces of the game that you will ever experience, but it is very, very crucial. For one, you can uh, have all of your market stuff all at once, or you can divide it between staple goods, industrial, luxury, or military. Personally, I always toggle between all of these because it's much more manageable. And if I'm looking for something like a staple good, it's easier than doing this and scrolling through and trying to find something as intensely. So your details, we'll go over all of this in a, in a more detailed video, but this gives you uh, your uh, supply, your demand, the balance between them and the price that you're paying. Trade routes are very important, but also at the same time, these are very, very confusing to me. Uh, for one, we have, you see the routes that we are currently using, and this is uh, going through all different places. We can see here, you can affect the tariffs within that, and then you can get a breakdown of how much exactly that you're making, which is great. Now, what you could do is you could see here, this gives you a list of goods that you need that you could import. It's a nice little handy tool. I use it frequently. You can also do the same for exporting. So if you have a large amount of goods, that you're like, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, what should I do? 
you can totally just export them. And by clicking on either one of these, it sets up a list of trade routes possible. Now, what you could also do is you could go to a new import route, which brings you to the import trade route trade lens that we were talking about earlier. So if for instance, well, I know I have, well, let's just get out of this for one. Say here, well, I really think I could export more wine. Let's go over here to the export route. Oh, hey, look, cool. I can't export wine. It looks like Russia could do it. Let's do it. So we'll be getting six bucks per or $7 per employee annually, which looks like right now only a net profit of 290. But regardless, I still am making a profit. So that is your trade routes in a very, very brief overview. And then, of course, this just gives you the members of your Austrian market. A customs union, for those who may not know, is simply a union between uh, two countries in which the primary, which is Austria, will envelop the market of the smaller nations. That means that right now, Parma only can affect my market. They no longer have their own market in which they get to contribute to. What does a customs union mean? It means that as the primary, I get to set tariffs on different trade routes. If you are a smaller country in someone else's market, you do not get to set that, but you get access to their market, which is very, very benef beneficial for smaller countries, although it does mean you'll have to work very, very hard to get out of it. So this just basically says, hey, these are the, these are the members of that these are uh, the states of all members by GDP or by market access. Market access is very important uh, to go over and figure out. If you don't have market access, you'll actually be losing the availability of resources. So that is your market overall. Again, I'll go into detail about this in its own separate video at greater length. Your buildings is similar in a way to your market in that it lists all of the resources, all the buildings that you have. So it is split up between urban, rural, development, which is your military and construction. Now, urban is going to be all of your industries, all of your city-based industries. And what's cool about this is that you have a way to affect them through their production methods and you can see where they are. Same goes for rural, same goes for development, and same goes for your production. We'll go into more detail here in just a little bit, of course, in its own video. But know that this is a good reference guide to see how much overall things are making and what you can do to influence said things. Your budget, oh, your budget's a big one because unlike hovering over your money where you see an overview, this allows you to directly influence certain aspects of your government's ability to make money or lose money. For instance, we can adjust the level of taxation. This is dependent on the law that you have, depends on how much revenue you make. I could tax the holy living heck out of my population for an extra 45,000 gold, but you would see I would get plus 50 radicals from standard of living decreases. You're taxing the people. They will have less money. Their standard of living will decrease, which means you would lose or you would gain, rather, a ton of radicals, and I highly recommend you stay away from that. This allows you to see things like your taxes, your consumption taxes. We talked about that with uh, your authority, the ability to add consumption taxes. It just allows you to get a, a good overview breakdown of everything that's going on. And then, of course, your ability to set the wages for your other areas of your world. It's all really great. What's more important though, well, I won't say more important. A really good thing here is, a, is a, the ability to see the average wages for all of your states, the expenses of the government across all of your states, and then the taxes that are being contributed across all of your states. Now, we of course, if you're in this, you see here, you can get an idea of uh, what states might be profitable and which aren't. Slavonia is not profitable for us. Croatia is not profitable for us. So we would need to go in here and find ways to make them more profitable, whether that is um, taking out universities or maybe reducing barracks in a region. In the case of you know Croatia, 
maybe we figure out a different way to, uh, yeah, reducing the barracks alone would fix that. Government administration would not help it, but also we could do other buildings that would increase the productivity of that area. And so that gives you your total balance overall. The last but not least is your assets. This allows you to see everything about your country from a monetary standpoint and what that means. So currently uh, we have 2.73 million in gold reserves. We are increasing by 15.7 thousand every month, which means that if we don't build anything or modify anything, we have a, uh, a cap that will reach out at 5.7 million. As I mentioned before, that cap isn't good because then you're losing money beyond that. But you're also able to see your credit. And I will go into more detail again with this, but know that this is the negative debt that you can accrue before you default and can declare bankruptcy. Now, I like to live in debt in this game because it's very beneficial and I'll tell you why in the own video. Last but not least at all is politics. This gives you a grand overview and a detailed breakdown of your government. It's broken up into an overview, your leader and everything about them. The legitimacy of your government, which is tied to how um, influential certain things are based on uh, elections or how they are viewed overall. Legitimacy is very important and you can reform your government and kick out and bring in other people which might or might not bring in your legitimacy up or down. Adding too many will cause uh, a too large of a government which no one really likes, but removing the right kinds of people will cause your legitimacy to grow, go up. And we'll take a look at legitimacy in a little bit as well. So no, this is your overview. This is your actual government where you can reform if you wanted to, but it lets you see all of your influential things about your country or about your interest groups and the traits within, et cetera, et cetera, that you don't necessarily get right here. This gives you the breakdown of the interest groups. Your laws are very, very important as they determine, well, they determine how much authority you have, as I've mentioned before, but it also just shapes your country in so many different ways. Now, what you'll see here is that we have the ability to change a couple of laws, which is dependent on a whole lot of different factors, but know that this wouldn't pass. And if it did try to pass, a lot of people would be very, very upset at us. I would caution you to not try and be ultra progressive right off the bat because it could wreck your economy, it could wreck your radicals and cause a lot of issues. But know that they are broken up into power structure, economy, and human rights. And your ability to influence your laws is directly tied to what interest groups are in your government and how influential those interest groups are and how well received they are. Now, there are things within your laws that allow you to have institutions. Among them are education, law enforcement. I'm trying to think of other ones. Health, uh, welfare is another one as well. And essentially, these are institutions that you can increase at the cost of bureaucracy that would allow you to have more and more of an effect. If we were to go all the way to level five with education, we would get 50% education access and assimilation of other cultures and other people would be at 62.5%. That's pretty intense. Know that every level of decrease or increase will take 50 weeks, so almost a full year. And of course, as that goes up and increases, we need another 400 or 345 bureaucracy. So you can see there that uh, that is what it pretty much takes to up the next level. Again, you can increase bureaucracy by building government buildings uh, and doing other things of that nature uh, to increase the bureaucracy amount. But believe me, I will tell you this, it is very, very uh, to your advantage to try and level up your institutions as much as your laws will allow. And ladies and gentlemen, that will wrap up the overall user interface tutorial for Victoria 3. I know it was a chonker, but I appreciate you hanging out and you sticking with me through all of it. Guys, there is so much more to this, and I have just gone on a brief overview of all of the systems. If you will, if you want to, I'm going to break down all of these five main ones, the military, market, buildings, budget, and politics, into their own user interface tutorial to kind of give you a more in-depth look at what all that means. Not necessarily how it operates, but just the functionality of it. I know that kind of sounds like the same thing. 
So if you want to, you can definitely look out for those. Those will be going up on the channel along with all the other bite-sized chunks that I mentioned at the beginning. Guys, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope this really helps you make sense of the game and ways that you can play it. If it did, you can support this channel by giving the video a thumbs up. You can leave your comments in the comment section down below. But the biggest ways that you can do support is by subscribing and interacting in all of the ways and including if you want to become a YouTube member, which will have its own benefits that I'm currently restructuring. So if you want to support financially the channel, you can become a member. You can super thanks. That's another thing that's new and awesome. And lastly, if you have yet to purchase the game, following the link in the description will give you a 10% uh, off, I do believe, and will also allow you to support this channel as much as possible through a small commission. Guys, I hope you enjoy this game. It's a lot of fun. I have over 70 hours into it, and I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for watching. This is Havoc, and I'll see you on the next Victoria 3 video.